let us revisit the situation where we consider the block that is sliding to rest. So initially we have this block that's moving with some speed, and then later it's going to be just v equals zero. So if we try to draw an energy bar chart for this situation, well, we start out with some kinetic energy, um, and it's you know moving with some speeds. So this is a positive value. And then later, the kinetic energy goes to zero. All right, and the way that we explain this is by considering thermal energy. So in this case, the thermal energy is going to match the initial kinetic energy. Um, and then the um, initial thermal energy is zero. Um, it's not really zero, um, it could have lots of thermal energy, but we really just want to show the change. And so I'm going to assume that it starts at zero so that it's easy to see how it's changing. Um, okay, so this is fine, but if we think about it, some of that thermal energy will be inside the block and some of the thermal energy will be inside the table because the block is going to heat up and so will the table and the other surroundings. So I'm going to draw a line in here and say that part of this is in the block and the other part is in the table. And I have no idea how that's split up. It could be 50-50, or it could be almost all of it in the block or almost all of it in the table. I have no idea. And neither do you. It doesn't really matter. Um, all we know is that it's split up in some way. Okay, so um, we know that the um, thermal energy is split between the table and the block. So if we're going to consider the system that is both the block and the table, like this, then this graph is correct. But if we're going to consider just the block and ignore the table, if we want to consider the table to be external, like this, like I'm drawing with these um, green dots, then um, this initial graph is going to look right, but my final graph should be just the part that includes the block, and the part from the table should be zero. Okay, so what that'll look like then is if we consider the block only, we have kinetic energy, like this, um, and thermal energy, like so. We have kinetic energy here is zero, but the thermal energy is like this, well, this doesn't appear to solve or to conserve energy, but if we're only considering the block, then we have an external force on the block that's doing work. That external force is friction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a dotted line here to indicate that um, I'm going to show work on this side. And the friction is to the left while the block slides to the right. So we're going to have a negative work like so. Okay, so we can consider friction is doing work. So friction does negative work on the block. Okay, but notice that the work done by friction is less than the change in kinetic energy. Okay, so that is not what the work kinetic energy theorem tells us. Um, from the work kinetic energy theorem, we would expect those two things to be the same. But in this situation, the work done by friction is less than the change in kinetic energy because some energy stays behind as thermal energy. Okay, so that's pretty weird. And you might think maybe we can just ignore that. Um, maybe the thermal energy is not a big deal and so we can consider the um, work done by friction to equal the change in kinetic energy and nothing bad happens. But um, if we're going to do a completely consistent um, analysis using conservation of energy, which we should, then we have to be really careful about this and consider that some of the energy stays behind even though it's not in a form that's easy to notice. The thermal energy is you know, in some ways kind of hidden in this process because it's not as dramatic as an object's speed or its position. Um, so what this um, tells us, um, because the work is not equal to the change in kinetic energy in the case of friction, that means that the work um, done by friction is not equal to the force of friction times the displacement times cosine theta. Um, it's just simply not in the case of friction. Um, so this is kind of a detail in some ways, but in some ways not. So um, essentially the takeaway here is that it's really hard to calculate the work done by friction. We might not be able to do it at all in most cases um, because we're considering the thermal energy that gets left behind in the system as part of it. So what on earth is going on here? Why is this happening? Why doesn't friction behave like other forces? Well, um, if we draw kind of a microscopic model of what's going on at the interface between the two objects, um, on a microscopic level, the objects are going to look kind of bumpy. So I'm going to draw the, the sort of like microscopic nubs like this on the two objects. And um, you know what these might look like as they kind of rub together um, like this, maybe some of the nubs are in contact and some are not. And as the two objects slide past each other, maybe there is um, some deforming of those nubs. So the actual point of contact here between those two nubs um, is not actually moving very far. So the displacement of the point of contact is um, less than overall motion. In addition, we don't actually know how the forces at each of those points compare. So maybe some um, individual nubs are in contact and those have large forces, other spots are not in contact and have no forces. So um, overall, friction is really quite complicated and there's a lot going on. So this is, a, in, this is an explanation for why friction doesn't behave like other forces because the point of contact and the force um, don't really look the same on a small level. Um, we can also kind of wonder what's going on with the thermal energy. So um, if I sketch a different kind of um, microscopic model for a material, um, we can kind of imagine that it's built up out of individual molecules 
like this. Um, and sort of a physicist's view of how this works is we can imagine those molecules are all connected together by springs. So they're allowed to move, but um, you know they can't move freely like in a liquid or something. They have to um, stay in roughly the right arrangement. Well, what happens as um, you slide two objects across each other is these molecules are going to get disturbed. And so they're going to start oscillating back and forth, um, but not moving freely, just moving you know, back and forth within the constraints of these individual little springs. Okay, and so this um, sort of oscillatory motion, this is the thermal energy that we have. Okay, so thermal energy is basically um, random kinetic energy of the molecules. Okay, um, and the thermal energy is going to spread around, right, as these oscillations spread throughout the material. So it won't just stay in one spot, it'll, you know, move throughout all the parts. Um, okay, so you might wonder then, is it hopeless to try to understand what's going on with friction? And the answer is not necessarily. So we can do some calculations with friction still. So um, one thing is that sometimes we actually can ignore the thermal energy. Okay, so in those cases uh, where we can ignore thermal energy, um, then we can do uh, what's called pseudo work. Um, and the pseudo work um, is the force times the displacement for the friction. Okay, so um, that's sort of what you would normally expect it to be. And a lot of times you can get away with making this simplification to a problem and nothing bad happens. But just keep in mind that it's not really conservation of energy and this um, approximation is not quite right. The other thing that we can do is we can consider friction and internal force. So if we design our system in such a way so that the interface between the two objects is completely inside the system, um, so in this case, including the block and the table together in the system, well then nothing bad happens because there's no external work. So um, any thermal energy that's created stays inside the system. So we can figure out the total amount of thermal energy. We don't need to know how much stays in the block versus how much stays in the table. Okay, so the big takeaway here is that um, ordinarily um, we can just do work equals change in energy without having too many troubles, but friction really does lead to a variety of odd parts. So um, you want to be really careful. If you can solve a problem by making friction be an internal force, that's the best way to go. Um, the book goes into a lot of detail about the pseudo work where um, you treat friction as sort of an ordinary force that does the pseudo work, which is its force times displacement. I don't really like that very much. I think it's more confusing than helpful, but sometimes that can be helpful for solving problems.